Welcome to another great episode of The Bourbon Road with your hosts, Jim and Brian, where they talk bourbon and, of course, drink bourbon. Grab yourself a pour, kick back, and enjoy another trip down the bourbon road. Very excited to have BlantonsBourbonShop.com as a new sponsor for the Bourbon Road Podcast. In fact, this podcast is brought to you by Blanton's Bourbon Shop. BlantonsBourbonShop.com is the only official merchandiser for Blanton's, the original single barrel. Looking for a unique gift? Blanton's Bourbon Shop has got you covered. BlantonsBourbonShop.com is your home for all Blanton's gifts. The Bourbon Road is excited to have PintsAndBarrels.com as a sponsor of this episode, as well as our official custom apparel provider. Be sure to check out PintsAndBarrels.com and browse their ultimate online store for bourbon lovers. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to another episode of the Bourbon Road Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Shannon, and today we have a very special guest for you, pretty excited about this it's been a a couple months in the works we finally made it happen uh today on the show we have uh dominic guillelmi and uh he is the author of warehouse h it's uh the story of blanton's bourbon america's most influential whiskey this is a book that just recently released uh we did get an advanced copy brian and i we managed to get through it and and uh really enjoyed the read dominic Welcome to the Bourbon Road. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Jim. Well, we are both going to drink a little Blanton's today. I think you're going to one up me, though. I'm I'm drinking a standard release. I have a dump date of eleven eighteen twenty two, so it's been out for about a year. Nice. I've got a straight from the barrel. It's one hundred and thirty two point nine proof uh, from two thousand twenty one. So pretty potent. Well, you are having some fun tonight. (laughs) Small sips, small sips, (laughs) small sips. All right. Well, cheers. Cheers to you. Boy, we do love to get straight to that bourbon. And that is such a wonderful pour. I usually like to warm up a little bit. Yeah, this is um, a very hot pour, but it's, it doesn't have a lot of burn. It's very flavorful. A lot of, a lot of caramel and uh, just a uh, little chocolate. It's very sweet. That's how I like my bourbon. Well, we're going to talk a lot about Blanton's today, but before we get to Blanton's, let's talk a little bit about you. You have recently become an author, and this is your first book, right? First book, yeah. And uh, tell me a little bit about kind of how you got into bourbon, how you got into Blanton's specifically, and and honestly, what made you say, I need to write a book? <laughs> well, it was a journey. Um, and starting off, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I like so many over the past decade, um, got into bourbon just as things, you know, began to explode and sort of took notice from afar and, and, and seeing how everybody was gravitating towards it. And, and, uh, you know, maybe tried a few here and there. I didn't, I probably couldn't name more than one or two brands prior to 2017, uh, just because I had never really uh, educated myself, and you know, my my old boss came to me one day and you know said, "Yeah, let's come to bourbon party, come come to it, try it out." And I went, and I was I was you know very um, perplexed. It was just interesting. It was this whole culture. I could see people who were really into it. And before the party was over, she she said, "You know, here I want to give you a gift. Take take your first you know for your first bottle. Uh, take this." And it was a bottle of Blanton's. And I just, you know, like everybody else kind of fell in love with it. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything. uh, You know, even if you asked me to taste it, I probably wouldn't have gotten any tasting notes or anything like that out of it. I just thought it was pretty. And and that is truly the story of so many. And I think maybe that's uh, irks some people, you know, particularly seasoned bourbon people. Uh, when they when they kind of think about blends, which we can we can talk about, but uh, but that was you know that's how I fell in love with it, and then I just wanted more, and that that wanting more took me down a a quest and a path that led me through 
a significant level of acquisition of rare bottles, hunting it throughout the world, and uh, you know, eventually kind of realizing that I had learned so much on my journey that I had to to write a book about it to, to share with others, and 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 frankly, set the record straight in some cases because there's a lot of myths that have been told about the brand, or at least a marketing story that isn't always 100 percent accurate. Well, I'm gonna I want to. Step out on a limb here. I'm going to say you're probably a highly valued employee to receive a Blanton's <laughs> bottle from your boss. I, and this yeah, was 2018, yeah. <laughs> so this was right in the yeah, mid, yeah, in right. the midst of things, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. It was. Uh, uh, luckily, she uh, was quite the bourbon connoisseur. I had multiple bottles, and yeah, I think I I ranked pretty well. Uh, and uh, write write about her very fondly in the book, both in the uh, <laughs> the introduction and in the uh, acknowledgement section. So. <laughs> So very much like David Jennings, Rare Bird 101 is kind of the super fan of Wild Turkey. You're kind of positioned yourself as as kind of the super fan of of Blanton's bourbon. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 that's what as I learned about David and I read his book, there were so many similarities that I reached out to him um early in my writing journey and he was so supportive, uh, just a, a gentleman when it came to sharing his his time with me, uh, his experience, the sort of the the difficulties and the, the successes of of kind of becoming a published author. And so we we developed such a good rapport, and I was so thankful to him. I asked him to write the foreword for Warehouse H, and uh, he thankfully agreed. Uh, really put together a few nice pages of, of words that. Uh, it just show how well uh, how how strong he is as an author, and uh, and I'm just I couldn't be happier to have someone like David uh, as part of this project. I, I kind of get the sense that with the uh, authors, and at least in the in the area of whiskey writing, it seems like there's this uh, this generosity and this pay what pay it forward kind of mentality where um, each author as he as he puts out a book gets this tremendous support from authors who had have prior writings and then they they feel blessed to be able to pass that on to the next person it's kind of neat to see this as you read through yeah. the whiskey books you see these wonderful yeah. you know lead-ins to the books these forwards that are coming from other authors and you're like wow these guys yeah. are all connected you know they're all yeah, uh, it is it is a network and and it, it you know it's it's interesting because you're 100 percent right um and 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 i made sure to to give respect and sort of acknowledge those that have come before me and, and frankly are significantly more accomplished in, in their endeavors as a, as a writer. Uh, but at the same time, it was, um, it was a challenge because I knew if I was going to put something out there and it was going to be read by everybody, including all of those other authors, I, it had to be, had to be good. And it had to be at least decent uh, because you know, I didn't want ever, I didn't want to be known as the guy that put out the, the, the pamphlet on Blanton's, you know, I wanted it to be something substantial. And I think that's, been probably the the biggest positive in this ex, in this whole experience is the reception, uh, not just from those other authors, but from you know everyone, uh, nearly everyone, uh, really acknowledging the fact that the book turned out pretty well. I'm, I couldn't be more proud of that. You know, it's it's uh, I think the, the more than any dollars or anything like that, uh, it's the the biggest success. Well, I don't review a lot of books. I do review a few, and I have to say that I really enjoyed reading this one. Um, I'm kind of a history buff in a way, and I I love the way the – let me say the first half of the book kind of tells that history, you know, that story behind everything. I know the the first chapter or two kind of talk a little bit more about um, kind of the comeback story, right, Uh, how the the brands came back after – well, we can get into that. I'll let you get into that a little bit later. But, you know, sure. how it goes into the history of, of not just the brand, but, you know, the people behind it, the distillery behind mm-hmm. it, the transactions that took place between the principals and everything that involved. Mm-hmm. Not only that, mm-hmm. but of the bottles, the containers, the, you know, the labels, uh, the different. I mean, it's just yeah. it's very detailed. And uh, you give the right I think you give the right amount of detail to each of the subjects and it's uh it's not a quick read but it's a very enjoyable read and and i and i, I it was a pleasure definitely my pleasure well, thank to read you. It, it, i i appreciate that feedback and i i think it it strikes a, a chord with me because as i got into writing it i wanted to be able to provide some background i wanted somebody who 
was not familiar with bourbon, um, to be able to pick it up and, and, and read it and understand sort of where not only the Blanton's brand, uh, what it has done for, for bourbon, but just bourbon in general. But I also didn't want to write a book about just bourbon. Uh, right. That's been done quite a bit. It's been covered <laughs> extensively. And, and, you know, it, it was probably the hardest part of this was dialing back and striking a balance between that history and, you know, the detail that, that, you know, I wanted to go into, but I couldn't. And so it, it's a, it's a, it's a high level of Buffalo trace and the, the history of bourbon. But, um, I recommend to others, uh, reading books like Fred Minix, Paul Picoult, uh, those, uh, gentlemen have done some excellent deep dives into, uh, bourbon in general, but, uh, but I appreciate that. Well, it's kind of hard to talk about Blanton's The Bourbon in detail without first explaining to those who are less less knowledgeable, you know, what a mash bill is. You know, what, what's a mash bill? Yeah. What, you know, how, how is bourbon made? You know, what makes a bourbon a bourbon? Those things are all important and they, they set the foundation for what's to come, you know, further on in the chapter. So, uh, like I said, I think you gave the appropriate amount of detail where it was needed in order to get the, get the reader where he needed to be for what was, what was coming next in the, in the reading. So I really enjoyed it a lot. And it's, it's not over, um, it's not overburdened with uh, basic details. It's it really gets into the guts of it. And man, I tell you, me personally, I love that. I love the technical details. I love the the yeah. history and the and everything. And and I love that there was a lot of that in there. And, and great pictures too. Your your photographer is Thank fantastic. You. Thank you. Yes, um, I really, Nick Fancher uh, is an amazing photographer. And um, you know, again. One of the things mm-hmm. that uh, David Jennings shared with me as I consulted with him early on was, you know, just how important it is to have good photography in your book. And, uh, and that, you know, he, he set the standard because I think if you look across the, the various bourbon books, his is, has one of the more visually stunning um, uh, photography and it. it has most. It, it, so I, I really tried to emulate that and use that as a, a source of reference as I, I, I developed this. So I'm really proud of it. And I'm actually proud of the fact that there's, it's not just one photographer, although, although Nick did uh, a significant number of the still shots, certainly all the studio portraits and, and things like that. Um, there's photography from me in there. There's photography from friends in there. You know, if you look at the image credits, you kind of see all that, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it is very visually appealing and that's, uh, I think helps attract people to the book because they just pick it up and flip through it. Well, let, let's take a moment and talk about this early chapter on the cutback story. And can you kind of lay it out for our listeners, why this was an important thing to talk about? Yeah, absolutely. So as you, you know, you think about bourbon and where it, where it was after prohibition, after world war two, uh, in, as it got into the fifties and sixties, it rose to be the, the number one distilled spirit, uh, in America and it was booming. And, you know, as you get to the latter half of the sixties, you start to see this, this downturn, the, the baby boomer, generation started coming of age uh and as it's been well documented they they shunned they shunned whiskey uh, essentially they didn't want what their parents and grandparents were drinking they gravitated towards the white the white spirits your gin your vodka uh, also wine and so bourbon started to see this steep decline and that decline really took hold in the 70s and and by the 80s it had just hit hit the bottom. Um, and it was really a 25, 30 year period that bourbon was, um, was not, not the cool, not the cool kid. And so at the same time, this, the, the comeback story and and the reason why the the subtitle of my book is about Blanton's being the most influential whiskey in America is because if you, you know, if you discount today's perception of the brand, which has some negativity from the bourbon elite, as I like to call them, um, because it is such a popular bottle with people new to the to, to bourbon. Um, if you sort of discount some of that and you look back at the roots, when it was launched in 1984, it was significant. It it was a premium, you know, super premium offering that didn't do a whole lot initially, uh, because again, bourbon wasn't doing a whole lot here. Japan warmed up to it. And over the course of the next decade or so, sales sales certainly grew in Japan. But it it was a trendsetter. It 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 as I say in the book, it sowed the seeds of a bourbon comeback, and and it paved the way for other single barrels 
and, and small batch products to sort of elevate bourbon. That the the that didn't really happen for another decade or two as as sort of those roots took hold, but it was the genesis. It was the start of all of those things that you know by the late two thousands, two thousand ten or so, finally took took root and then just blossomed. Uh, so I, I you know that's the super condensed version, but uh, you know, certainly I think I think I say in the book, love it or hate it, but respect it. Um, Blanton's deserves that, and I, I think it's um, it's a pretty interesting story. Yeah, we can talk a little bit about that in the second half because there are there yeah. is that that love hate relationship with Blanton's, right? Everybody wants yeah. a bottle, but but by the same <laughs> token, you've got so many people saying ah Blanton's because they can't get it yep. or they have trouble getting it, so it's better to be a hater than a tater, right? I guess that's we, right. That's, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but bourbon really did have its heyday between 62 and 72, right? I mean, that was kind of really yeah. the core where bourbon was uh, was doing tr- tremendous things and doing very well. And mm-hmm. and then you 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 talk a little about the the a little bit about the light whiskey experiment in 68 yeah. that sort of fell flat by 72. Yeah, I'm not sure that light whiskey fell flat because it was light whiskey or just because it was whiskey. Period. Right? I mean, yeah, agreed, agreed. It, it didn't matter what what color it was or how uh you know how potent it was it uh it was just simply had that word whiskey in it and i think that was uh not not very popular so i guess it was it what was it vodka yeah. and gin and and tequila yeah pretty much yeah a little and wine those became the you know the things and you know it's interesting because my own story you know i'm 45 years old and so my my parents were baby boomers and grandparents were part of the greatest generation and it, it, my grandparents, grandfathers drank whiskey, um, and my parents didn't. Uh, and, and you know, it, it very much as I as I learned about all this, I, I could see it in my own family and my own you know heritage and, and sort of how the, the market was um, for those generations. Yeah, I think back, and I, I was born in '63, so right you know right at the at the beginning of the kind of the heyday for bourbon, of course, at, yeah. at diapers, I didn't care one way or the other, but <laughs> <laughs> by 81, I wanted some wild turkey that, you know, that's yeah. when I came of age. So yeah, I wanted sure. some wild turkey. So I didn't personally, I didn't sense there was a downturn in the whiskey market mm-hmm. uh, as a consumer, as a young consumer in the eighties, uh, I didn't sure. see there was a problem. I, I'm sure that compared to, Frank Sinatra's impact on the whiskey in the in the fifties, you know, compared to what mm-hmm. they were selling in the eighties, was nothing. Yeah, it was definitely a decline. It was a uh, pretty pretty remarkable. I think the number of distilleries that had to close up shop in, in the seventies, and and then along came Blanton's. And yeah, yeah, along came Blanton's. Let's talk a little bit about the Blanton's name and Elmer T. Lee and Age International and that that mm-hmm. whole that whole big deal that happened in the late eighties and early nineties where everything kind of shook up yeah. uh, for the brand. Sure. So I think, uh, you know, as you, as you look at the launch of plans, it happened in 84, of course, and it happened shortly after the distillery was purchased by two New York businessmen, Bertie Falk and Robert Baranaskis. They were industry executives for many years uh, through many different, you know, large, uh, large companies so they had experience and they and they came in and they essentially wanted they didn't really want the distillery at first they just wanted um the ancient age brand uh previous owner wouldn't sell them just the brand kind of said hey let's let's uh you know let's sell you the whole distillery and so their initial as they got underway they weren't just looking at bourbon production they were doing a significant number of import and export ventures at the time uh bourbon was just one of their revenue sources but certainly they recognized getting the distillery that they just bought up to full capacity and growing it was important. One of the things that um, Bertie and Bob had was sort of a, 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 a flair for, for expensive things. They, they liked the finer things in life. Both men were very successful and they recognized that with the impact of scotch on the American consumer, which had been growing uh, over the, the previous decade, that there was maybe a market for a bourbon at that level. And, and so they liked the concept of a single malt scotch 
and they they effectively worked with Elmer T. Lee, and you know the, the single barrel concept for bourbon was born. Different technically than single barrel Scotch uh, by definition, but what's interesting is Elmer T. Lee gets all the credit. And so in my book, I don't I don't rip all that credit away from him. He certainly played a part. Uh, he certainly is a legendary figure who I wish I wish I could have met uh, when he was still alive. But clearly, Ferdy and Bob had the marketing chops and had the uh, desire to introduce something new to the environment. And they went to Elmer and, and worked on it together with him. It it wasn't like Elmer was sitting around and just thinking up new product ideas at age 70 something or whatever, however old he was at 60 something. He was ready to retire actually. Um, so Ferdy and Bob, the book is dedicated to them as well because they played a big part in this and they seldom get credit uh, for, for that, um, for that launch and, and what they did. They wanted to make money and they, they, they thought that introducing a top tier product would do that. So that's one of the uh, kind of the areas I go into much more detail in, in the book uh, to try to so, honor them. So why did the three of them, let's just say the three of them yeah. uh, uh, decide to dedicate the bourbon to uh, Albert Bland? Well, and that's where Ferdy Falk's marketing skills came into uh, play. He was a very savvy marketer. And in working with Elmer, he learned of the story, of course, of that we all know now, where Colonel Blanton preferred his barrels to be picked uh, from generally the center, uh, middle, upper floors of Warehouse H and bottled for his own consumption parties, you know, things like that. And so you know, Elmer, of course, told him the story and, and Ferdy absolutely resonated with him easy to sell that story make it something you know attach the colonel's name to it so it all kind of came together as a um you know just a great marketing story now what's what's interesting though is while elmer was certainly telling the truth i assume about all that the concept of single barrels being better than you know a, a standard or a blended or a mingled uh, bourbon. It wasn't like that was only something that that <laughs> that Colonel Blanton knew. I mean, everybody in the industry knew that the the warehouse foreman knew which barrels they like to sip off of. The you know certainly the distillers, uh, you know the owners, everybody. Nobody just took it to market, but everybody everybody knew that there was honey barrels or sugar barrels throughout every warehouse and, and where to find them. Uh, it's no different today. So. Yeah, they were the ones with the belt buckle marks on the barrel, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's true. So Elmer T. Lee, being in his 70s at the time, had actually worked with Albert Blanton uh, before his uh, retirement from the business. Yeah, he did work with him for a few years directly before uh, Blanton retired in the early 50s. Yeah. And so he, he would have definitely um, worked around him. He, he said in interviews and, and, and kind of alluded to the fact that it, I don't think they worked extremely closely, just from what I was able to gather. But I, I think more importantly, until Blanton died in the later 50s, um, he was still living at his house there on the, the distillery property. So he was still around. He was retired, but you know he wasn't far away. So I, it, it did very much sound like they spent time over the years. Um, whether it was officially working together or just sort of in proximity. Yeah. Um, and that was great to see that legacy pass on because, of course, Elmer then, even in his retirement, was such a brand ambassador for Buffalo Trace and worked with you know folks like Harlan Wheatley, uh, who's there today. And uh, just pretty amazing to see that that legacy sort of continue and that knowledge get, get passed down. Absolutely. All right. Well, you and I are going to sit here and sip on our – remaining amounts of Blanton's in our class right. uh, and we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll pick up uh, in the early nineties when uh, the acquisition of age international took place. How's that? Sounds great. Cheers. Cheers. gift? 
Blanton's Bourbon Shop has got you covered. All of their handcrafted wood products are made in their in-house wood shop with authentic bourbon barrels. Specializing in barrel-aged potent treats, they use Blanton's barrels to age their own maple syrup, honey, and coffee. Find the most unique gift ideas for your golf lover, cigar connoisseur, avid coffee drinker, and Blanton's fan. Want to win an authentic Blanton's barrel head? Make sure you sign up for the giveaway on the homepage of their website. Blanton'sBourbonShop.com is your home for all Blanton's gifts. If you're a bourbon drinker, and I bet you are if you're listening to this podcast, you need to head over to PintsAndBarrels.com and check out the ultimate online store for bourbon lovers. Pints and Barrels Company was started by bourbon lovers for bourbon lovers. From spices to t-shirts, you'll find the perfect bourbon gift. Pints and Barrels proudly supports the bourbon road and invites you to visit PintsAndBarrels.com. Do you need a custom apparel or swag for your bar, distillery, maybe even your bourbon society? They can do that too. As a matter of fact, they print our apparel. We're so happy with the quality and fast turnaround. Pintsandbarrels.com, the ultimate bourbon lovers gift shop and branding specialist. All right, listeners, so we are back. We had a great first half talking a little bit about the history of, of Blanton's. We got ourselves up to about 1990, I think, and uh, we both had a great pour. I had a a 2022 Blanton's and a t- and in this half I've got a 2018 Blanton's uh, dump date of two two of 2018. What are you drinking, Dominic? And I've got a Blanton Special Reserve, and it is a eight eight twenty two. So what's interesting is I'm I'm dialing it back. While I was at a very high proof straight from the barrel during the first half, I'm now uh, at a very low proof of, and I'm kind of going backwards here. Normally I start low and end high. I thought I'd mix it up a little. Well, for those who aren't familiar with that particular expression, why don't you tell them a little bit about it? Yeah, so the the Green Label or Special Reserve Blantons is an international-only bottle. It was released uh, in 2000, and it's from it generally um, or first made its appearance in the Australian market. And it was a lower proof that was done for that specifically for that market uh, due to the the way that they tax alcohol based on the percentage of alcohol uh, in. in the bottle. So uh, that's where it first made its debut. Now it can be found in numerous countries, Europe, uh, Asia, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it's an introductory proof for sure. It's not my favorite, but uh, you know, it definitely goes down pretty easy and doesn't quite kick in the pants like the, <laughs> like the straight right. barrel. All right. Well, cheers. Cheers. Well, I know the difference that I'm getting here is this one is a little more kind of, uh, it's got a little bit more of a fruitier nose. I, like like the 2022 that I had was all baking spice, all a little bit of nuttiness, but uh, just a wonderful caramel waft. And this one's got a little bit of a fruity note to it, a little bit of... Uh, almost a little bit of cherry kind of to it and uh it has nothing to do with the year i'm sure it has more to do with probably the barrel it came out of right i mean wouldn't Mm -hmm. you say yeah absolutely being a single barrel sure it's a nice difference though it's nice to see the 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 difference between two barrels so let's hear about yours yeah my mine of course being a 80 proof is uh you know significantly different the um the thing i get is a lot of nutmeg and spice it is um, it is so much easier to to sip on than the uh, the one thirty two proof, but uh, but overall it it just has a uh, it's balanced. You know, certainly doesn't have any burn or kick to it. Uh, it's definitely something I could sip on for quite a while and probably make a pretty good dent in the bottle. Now Blanton's standard releases are typically at ninety three proof. Ninety three proof, yeah. Obviously, we've got uh, straight from the barrel, which is going to be higher, and then some reserve bottles that are going to be lower. But they've had some uh, some sort of uh, – I, I noticed in your book something I'd never heard before. They've actually had a 92-proof version that came out at one time. Yeah. it's uh, you know There's a section I have that kind of talks about oddities and one-off bottles. And you know there was a, there was a 92-proof that was done for at least a few years. Uh, I think we know of about three or four dump dates over two years 
that uh, appear to have all gone to Japan. I don't know that they didn't get released in the U.S., but all the bottles found have been found in Japan. And it's uh, you have to print it. It's not only written on the label as 92, uh, but it's printed where it actually has the printed um, text of the, the proof on every label. So it wasn't just a labeling error. It was clearly done intentionally. And uh, you nobody knows why, because at the time, you, know, you think about it, this is when bourbon was not all that popular. And so distilleries were, were trying to get rid of it. They were trying to, you know, they had a glut of bourbon aging in their, their warehouses. So the concept of diluting it further to stretch it and produce more bottles doesn't seem like it was the answer. So right. you know, who knows? And then Buffalo Trace sadly doesn't have records that indicate it. And so it's probably just a mystery that mystery we'll have to live with. Wow. All right. So let's pick up uh, 1990s, early 90s. Uh, there's a little bit of a shakeup going on in, uh, in, with Age International brand. What what happened? Yeah, so the, the, the two gentlemen I mentioned before, Ferdy Falk and Robert Baranaskis, effectively were, you know, recognizing that Ferdy was getting up there in the years and you know, they were they were kind of looking to cash in. And so they they wanted to also pay back their original investors that partnered with them. Um, you know, a lot of silent partners in, in the original deal. So at first, uh, they sold 22.5% uh, to Takara, um, which is a Japanese company. And they, you know, they had already been had a relationship with Takara. They, that, that, is, that was established in the late 80s uh, when they switched their Japanese distribution from Suntory to Takara. And there's a whole backstory there that really was that Suntory was the main uh, company in Japan that was distributing American alcohol all the way back to the 60s, really. Uh, so there was a long history with Suntory that sort of soured in the late 80s, and they flipped over to Takara. Takara really fell in love with the brand and eventually invested this 22.5% in the early 90s. That then allowed Ferdy and Bob to pay back their investors. And it also gave Takara a little more influence. They got a seat on the board of directors of Age International. And they were able to, you know, kind of start to craft some decisions or shape some decisions. And so soon after that, you see the release of the um, the gold edition, uh, which yeah. came, came about in 1992. Uh, you see some special edition bottles that were released in Japan at that time. Uh, you also see the um, red, Takara red um, bottle, which is the 93 proof, but aged longer than the standard Blanton's release. Uh, you see that make its debut in 1990 uh, in in uh, Japan. So that influence uh, spread quickly. And so by 1992, if I'm correct, uh, Ferdy and Bob were kind of kind of looking for the exit, and they uh, they had a we're buyer, done. and <laughs> yeah, they were done. And and they, the whole acquisition story and sort of what happens from there is uh, is is interesting as well. And I can I can go into that a bit if you like. Well, I think we'll we'll leave that for the reader, but let's just say it was quite the chess game, right? It was it was quite the chess game, and I appreciate that. Yeah, there's some there's some backstory there that's uh, it's worth reading, and and there's ramifications of that decision that happened today. Um, you know, I, I think uh, as as you mentioned earlier, uh, Age International is is the company that owns Blanton's, um, and they you know every, Buffalo Trace gets all the credit. So you know that's an interesting thing that you know today unless you are a bourbon person and kind of understand some of the details behind it you immediately associate buffalo trace with the brand that effectively their contract distilling the the you know on behalf of a different company so it's uh it's kind of yeah. interesting so the players at the time were you know sazerac and uh takara and uh age international i th- I, th- I think there was uh there was another player in the game there at the time uh um, yeah you blind, you blind, <laughs> and yes. and uh, but they, but they there was also Heaven Hill was involved in some way, so there was a mm-hmm. lot of players that were interested in uh, yeah. you know in trademarks and the distillery or whatever you know. But at the end of the day, um, Sazerac ended up with the distillery, and Age mm-hmm. International ended up with the brands under Japanese ownership. Correct, more yep. more or less. Right, and and it's it's interesting because you 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 mentioned brands, so it it was just more than than Blanton's that that Age acquired. Um, along with it came the other products that the distillery was producing at the time. Uh, certainly, uh, Elmer T. Lee brand, uh, Ancient Age, 
Rock Hill Farms, Hancock's Presence Reserve. I, mean, I might be missing one of them. Um, but the, 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 those brands, which all still exist today, are, are known as, as Mash Bill number two products. And Mash right. Bill number two is the, the, effectively the age internationally owned Mash Bill or recipe that, um, that again, still is produced today uh, at Buffalo Trace. Um, yeah. And this is a Mash Bill that's in the 12 to 15% rye range, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's considered a higher rye um, Mash Bill at Buffalo Trace. That that on its own isn't necessarily a high rye percentage, but uh, compared to the mash bills of mash bill one, for example, at Buffalo Trace, it's assumed to be a higher higher rye. So, for all those who f- who think that Blanton's and Rock Hill Farms and Elmer T. Lee and Hancock Reserve are Buffalo Trace products, we can set them straight right now. They're age <laughs> international products, yeah. and in the U.S. Uh, Buffalo Trace has, or Sazerac has, uh, management over distribution. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 they um they get all the glory, they get all the hate as well. I think there's quite a bit of you know due, sure. due to allocation rules and things, but they effectively control very little. H International is is the owner, and they're very silent behind the scenes. Uh, they certainly protect their international interests in their Japanese market as well. Um, you know, but people that you know, I. I <laughs> I, I I get a little frustrated when I read comments on you know a, a Blanton's Facebook post, official Blanton's or Buffalo Trace Facebook posts, you know, where immediately it's flooded with people that just want to complain. Wait, make more of it or do this. So you're, you know, you're, if you're complaining on Buffalo Trace's social media, you're talking to the wrong people. They they're just making it, and they're they're following what Age International is asking them to do, and of course, certainly within the limits of their capacities as well. But uh, they can't help you. <laughs> well, I, I can understand that. Now, we we wrote a, a pretty compelling article on the kitchen table restaurant at uh, James B. Beam Distilling. And mm-hmm. I continue to get uh, messages, comments on there all the time asking for reservations. And there's nothing I can do for them. <laughs> so. <laughs> <There's>, yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll take that off my list of questions I had for you now. So <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> That's but funny. but let, now that's kind of the lead into international. I mean, but H International still controls their own <laughs> international destiny, right? And yeah. so uh, Blanton's is distributed worldwide, and it's very popular, uh, not only mm-hmm. in the East but in Europe as well. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, so in in the um, the nineties, you know, again the the market in the U.S. was just ever so slight, slightly starting to, to grow. And uh, internationally, Japan being one of the highlights, um, it was it was growing at a much faster pace. Uh, Europe really started taking taking off, and so by the late '90s, early 2000s, you see products like uh, Bland Silver, which is now discontinued, and Gold uh, being released within the European market. So you you you're getting that sort of that penetration into other other areas that are that are growing, and. Um, I think around that same time in the U.S., you had, you know, sort of an awakening. You had people that were starting to see bourbon a little differently. Um, my generation was coming of age, late '90s, early 2000s, and you know, kind of going back to what I mentioned in the first uh, half, we we didn't see our parents drinking whiskey, and so for us, it was new. It was it was cool. It, it didn't have an image that was associated with anything really. And uh, and yeah, so I think in the, as you get into the, the latter half of the early two thousands, there you, you see um, you see quite a quite a change. As I write about in the book, I, I link it a little bit to the craft brew movement and and how that exploded. And I, w- I won't give away all the details, but there certainly was a, a parallel there, um, related or unrelated. So, uh, how does Blanton's popularity kind of rank worldwide? I mean. We have Australia, we have Asia, you know, Japan and so forth. We have uh, Europe, both Eastern Europe and Western Europe. You know, how do you see Blanton's um, playing out in those areas as far as popularity? That's a great question. I, I think um, I'd, I'd love to see the official sales stats on that. If you, <laughs> if you have any of those, uh, I'd love to see them. But, you know, from my own observations and talking to people, the, the popularity in the U.S., certainly exceeds all other markets. And that's evident by 
you know, even without knowing the distribution numbers, how much, you know, it, demand it is here. Um, I can tell you from six trips to Japan, it is getting harder to find in Japan, but that I ha- even hesitate to use the word harder uh, or more difficult because it's still not difficult. It, it can be found very easily in multiple locations. I haven't quite seen the same mountains of Blanton stacked up in some of the stores on the most recent trip I made this, this past spring, but still plentiful. Um, same thing. I was in, in, in France last, in Europe and France last year and found it fairly easy to, to obtain. I think, uh, Eastern Europe is interesting. I think Eastern Europe is where it may not quite have the same level of popularity and that popularity may have declined. Uh, one of the <clears throat> Blanton's sort of collecting, um, or preference, uh, uh, bottles that people like to collect, I should say, is the M and P bottle, which is also known as the Polish release. M and P is a, a store in Poland, and they had a bottle that was specifically dedicated for their market from 2014 till 2018. They had trouble selling it. It was uh, it was often bundled with other bottles. Uh, it was very much not not something that flew off the shelves, and only probably the demand from collectors in the U.S. kind of helped move it to the levels that it did. Uh, so much so that really after 2018, they uh, Age International effectively stopped releasing this m and p only store exclusive um, Polish bottle. Uh, now they've they've moved on and they're focused on uh, something called the special release, which is an annual release done primarily released in, in the European markets um, every year since two thousand and nineteen but the but the Paris releases, the releases that happen yes. uh, let's talk about those a little bit. La Maison de whiskey, the house of whiskey. so that uh, that all goes back to the early two thousands. The uh, the owner of La Maison de Whiskey uh, was in college in the U S. I believe, and he, you know, fell in love with Blanton's here and um, took it back to his his parents. And I think they started importing it. It was actually the late nineties. I think when he was he was uh, a student here, and so they started importing it in their liquor store, uh, which we now call LMDW for short. And um, it it really you know, did well, I think, as the the market was growing there in France and, and Europe. And so by 2006, 2007, they had partnered enough and imported enough and seen enough growth that working with Age International, they were able to create a specific bottle for, for them, a, a specifically labeled bottle for them. Uh, that was uh, that was done at the time, and now has become a tradition, annual tradition. And I should back up and mention one thing: in 2002, it was LMDW that effectively convinced Age International to produce straight from the barrel. Oh, really? They wanted the barrel proof. Yeah, yeah. They, they wanted the barrel proof. They went to them and said, "Hey, we should, we should you guys should do this," and and Age agreed. So uh, that that they had pretty good influence there, and again. Shortly thereafter, they were able to get their own their own label, and it's a it's a beautiful bottle every year. I catalog, of course, all of them in my book and on my website. Uh, but those are some of the most highly collectible bottles um, are the LMDWs. And I'm looking behind you on your wall, and you just have just this <laughs> this wonderful. Well, and and not only that, if if somebody goes to your website, warehouseage.com, they can see. Uh, some pretty amazing photos of your um, collection, your bar, and that's where you're sitting now. I'm assuming because it looks very similar yeah. to the pictures mm-hmm. that I saw. Um, just a tremendous collection of Blanton's bottles and and Blanton's paraphernalia in general. And uh, I, I'm assuming there's a LMDW 60th back there somewhere. There is absolutely. It's sitting up there on the shelf behind me. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, Blanton's has uh, has gotten to this uh, this level of uh, fame, infamy, if you want to call it that. That uh, <laughs> you know, you've got this dichotomy out there of people who are, and I mentioned it earlier, haters or taters, right? And yep. what do you what do you consider yourself? You're obviously a, a tater, right? I, I'm a yeah, I'm a, a, a super tater. I'm a, the tater of all taters. I, I think uh, you know the, every name in the book. And which, by the way, I I wear those as a badge of honor. That uh, you sure. you cannot insult Blantons and offend me. Um, I've heard it all, and I don't disagree with ninety nine percent of it. So 
<laughs> it, it, a lot of that comes out of the fact that people just can't easily get their hands on the bottle. So rather yeah. than uh, complain about not being able to get it, it's better to say it's, ah, it's no good or, or it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's just average bourbon or, you know, yeah. whatever you yeah. hear. I mean, what are some of the yeah. things that you hear? Well, I, you know, that people call it Blandons, implying, of course, that it's bland. Um, you know, the, the market, I, I, I have a book or excuse me, a chapter in my book specifically called uh, Polarization. And it is dedicated to sort of everything we're discussing here. And, and, and to me, I break it down. For those at home listening who are thinking, you know, this guy's the biggest, biggest tater on earth. I am, but I also take a very fair view at it and I break it down. And as I, I just said, I don't disagree with some of the hate. Um, I, I would say this to overpay for a bottle of Blanton's if you've never had it and you're new to bourbon and you just want it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that to consistently overpay for Blanton's. I agree is excessive. Um, as a, at an MSRP, you know, around 60, 65 bucks, that's probably where it's priced. And most people, most bourbon elite people will agree that's, you know, about the range it should be. Um, so get it if you really want it, but don't, don't be paying $200 a bottle every, you know, and, and consistently doing that, um, that, that does get excessive, uh, but it's a good bourbon. And, and again, just because, in the lineup of bourbons today, it may not be at the top. Doesn't mean we can't respect where it came from and what it did, as we discussed yeah. earlier. So, so I think it's it's appreciating that. But yes, the, the the hype. You know, I think that the thing I hate the most is every single Facebook group discussing bourbon. Somebody posts their picture of look look what I got, and and then immediately 30, 40, 50 people want to share why that's a tater bottle, what, what bourbons are better. It's, it's just, it's exhausting. It's, uh, you know, but, but it just continues to continues to go. <laughs> it kind of, kind of wears me out just a little bit. I mean, yeah. we've got, uh, you know, we've got one of the things we're interested in as a podcast or our reviews of our channel and sure. how things are going. And we have a huge number of five Five, I think we're at a four point nine nine or something, right? As far as That's reviews awesome. go, well, they don't go to two digits, but we're four point nine. And the <laughs> reason go. we're not five point oh is because one or two people, one in particular, one guy, one guy wrote one <laughs> one one star review. He said, "Blanton's this, Blanton's that." I'm tired of hearing it. <laughs> so, there you go. There you, there go. you go. Right. Right. It's, <laughs> it, uh, it it will forever bring uh, love. Uh, scorn it's uh it's a very polarizing bourbon and uh it, you know i i just um I, I think that today it gets it gets a little bit of a bad reputation because it is so coveted uh but it it's still a decent bourbon uh bottle to bottle i've had some that are exceptional uh i've had others that are not so good and then uh you know i think you'll find out with any single barrel but it's intense it's intensified with um with plants for sure so let's talk a little bit about supply and demand. You kind of uh, one of the chapters in your book is is kind of dedicated to supply and demand. Mm -hmm. you know, where are we at today? What's it looking like? What's the future of Blanton's availability look like for the rest of us? It's um, I, I, I'll answer that and then work backwards. Uh, it's likely to not get any better than what you, what you've seen it recently. Uh, they are making a lot more of it than they used to. It, they've recently, within the past few years, added a third shift. They being Buffalo Chase added a third shift to their Blanton's bottling hall. Uh, they're bottling right now about ten thousand bottles a day, and that's at max capacity. One of the things, and I'll I'll save this for the readers, but I go into the math and explain how at that level of bottling and barrel dumping, it's not possible for all. Blanton's to have lived its entire life in warehouse H, which is, uh, I was, kind of was going to say, <laughs> yeah, it, it, the math doesn't add up and I I'll, I'll leave it at that and let people dive into that later. Um, but, um, even with that, they're effectively right now, probably most limited by, by two things, either the bottling hall process itself, meaning that they would have to expand their bottling line and have additional bottling lines or, Age International's own potential limitations that they've placed 
on on the, the output. I don't know of any reality of that. I just you know speculation as to what would prevent them. The 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 one item which folks may think is obvious would be the the aging and the time it takes to get the you know distill it to 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 be ready to dump. Uh, but again, Buffalo Trace has done significant expansions recently, and they're not limited to just warehouse H. I'll leave it at that. But uh, you know that is that is a factor, and and um, it's not the only factor though. But I, I tell people all the time, you know, don't don't treat. And I, I put this in the book. I don't blends it unless it's one of the the very coveted bottles, the collector's bottles, of which again I I detail all of those in the book. Unless it's one of those. Don't treat the standards Blanton's lineup, including the international varieties. Don't treat them as unicorns. Uh, certainly, with respect to everybody's price points and what they can afford, I, I understand that. But Blanton's is not a unicorn. Um, a, a currently produced, you know, we'll say last 10, 15 year bottle, it, it's just, it's not. And, and so drink it. If you got one of those, um, don't, don't put it on the shelf and, you know, wait for your kid's 21st birthday. There, there are other bourbons out there that I would highly recommend you do that with, but man, not blends. Now, if you love the brand like me, you're going to do it anyway, but but it's not really a, a unicorn in that sense. I know you're a, you're a Blanton's super fan, and you drink Blanton's probably a lot of the time, but there must be some other bourbons that sort of make it on your list. <laughs> you know, um, I, I don't have a deep list. I, I generally tell people that I will drink anything you put in front of me. And uh, it doesn't have to even be bourbon. Um, very flexible, uh, <laughs> alcohol flexible. But I would say, you know, I, I don't even have a sophisticated taste. Uh, just a good old Woodford Reserve is one of my go tos. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I I know it's you know it's easily easy to find. Um, but you know the double oak, some things like that, I enjoy. I I uh, um, I like a weeded bourbon every now and then, you know, even, even yeah. maker's products uh, as, as they branched out and kind of had additional expressions. I've enjoyed some of those, but, uh, you know, angels envy is another one I'll, I'll pick up. I'm, I'm not really, um, not, not too, uh, I, let me put it this way. I don't shop by, by price. I shop, but what, what I like and what tastes good. Sure. Uh, and, and, um, uh, you know, the, I'm not, uh, not too stubborn there. And I don't, I, I look forward to Fred Minnick's reviews every year where he comes out with his list because uh, <laughs> that, that always gives me some kind of some, some ideas and things like that. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you this question. Staying in the mash bill here, ain't ancient age 80 or ancient age 90? 90. 90. Which one's your 90? Oh, you 90. like 90 better. Wow. Yes, I do. I'm yeah. an, I'm an, I'm an 80 guy. You're an 80? Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. What, what makes you like 80 better? What's the, I don't know. I've just side by side. I choose the 80. I, I'm not sure why it is. I just, uh, I tend to like it just a little bit better. I, okay. I don't know. I don't know what the difference is or where they pull the barrels from or whatever it yeah, is. I just, they're, yeah. they're different. They are definitely yeah. different. No, proof, they're, they're obviously, different. but otherwise, yes. Yeah. Yeah. They do. And, and they, um, it's interesting, you know, a Buffalo Trace has, um, of course, tasting panels that they use that, you know, are, are tuned to meet every product's, you know, sort of flavor profile and, and trying to make sure it matches. But it's amazing to me how different all the products are just based on that aging and based on that warehouse location. And it's just, it's fantastic. But yeah, the, the 90 for me was always just a, a little bit better, but I, I tend to gravitate towards a higher perch anyway. So, Well, Dominic, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show today. It's been an even better time sitting here and sipping whiskey with you sipping on a little bit of blanton's i wish we could have been in the same room it would have been uh just a little bit better we could have drank the same whiskeys but you know these are single barrels they're all going to be a little bit different so what the hey right absolutely they're fantastic it's a great great being with you and uh thanks for having me and uh you know for for those interested in the book you can check out my website, plantonsbook.com, or my my main collecting website, warehouseage.com. All right. And you're on Instagram as well? I am. Yep. Uh, at Warehouse H Info is my name there. Well, fantastic. Well, I highly encourage all of our listeners to check out warehouseh.com, plantonsbook.com, and Warehouse H Info on Instagram. Uh, Definitely pick up your book. It's a great read. I mean, it's it's a super high quality book. You you really did a fantastic job. I, I think David 
steered you in the right direction there. Uh, you you really put out a quality, you really put out a quality book, something that I'm proud to have on my shelf. And I, I thank you for including us in the early release and allowing us to have you on the show and, and uh, sort of dig your Blanton's brain just a little bit. It's, it's always interesting to get into the history of things and, and, and to hear about how, what we have today came about. I mean, for me, that's always fun. I, I enjoy it so much. Well, thank you, Jim. I appreciate all your, all your feedback and comments. Thank you so much. All right. Well, you can find The Bourbon Road on all social media outlets. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. You can find us on TikTok, even Threads now. We're doing them all. You can find us on all those places. Every single week, we put out an episode on Wednesday. We'll always have somebody cool on the show like Dominic. We'll uh, we'll dig into a subject. We'll drink a little bit of bourbon. It's always fun. Always a great time. We hope you join us every single week. To make sure you don't miss us, scroll to the top of that app. Hit that subscribe button. That way you get that notification every week that uh, Jim and crew have put out another episode. You can always go to our website, thebourbonroad.com. We've got a contact us page on there. If you've got an idea for a show or a guest or you've got a distiller in your hometown is just doing it right, definitely let us know about it. We would be happy to hear. We'll reach out to them. We'll get a bottle of their whiskey. We'll uh, taste it, review it, have them on the show. It's always fun. But until the next time, we'll see you down the bourbon road. <laughs> <laughs>